So we have been studying the book of Acts since September, um, and we are right right past the halfway point, a couple chapters past it. Um, Just just a quick recap for you guys, if you don't know. Um, So so Pastor Kirk, by the way, he kicked us off in September, and he misses you guys. Uh, He will be back next Thursday. Um, He had, for those of you guys that don't know, he had eye surgery, and so he's still in recovery. He looks... He looks pretty good for having eye surgery. I actually was going to show you guys a picture just so you can see how he's looking. Can you guys go to that next slide for me? Um, so he... <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> next time you see him, when, you, when he comes back next Thursday, just, just look at him and go, Adrian! If you don't get that, you have got to get on Netflix tonight and watch Rocky. Okay, I'm just saying. Anyways, uh, but seriously, though, he will be back next Thursday, but he kicked off this whole Acts series. So just to give you a quick recap, you can basically divide Acts up into two parts. There's two main characters that almost split Acts in half. The first half of Acts is Peter. The second half, pop quiz, is Paul. The second half of Acts is Paul. Um, So chapters 1 through 12 is Peter. Peter really, God uses Peter to establish the church. And God uses Paul to expand the church. And the way that Paul does that is through three missionary journeys. Go on to that next slide. He goes through uh, three missionary journeys to expand the church. And so we have been reading in chapter 17 his second missionary journey. Um, it's, uh, the second missionary journey goes through chapters 15, 16, 17, and on into 18. Uh, it it was, was about three years after his first missionary journey that he went out. It was his first journey with Silas. It's also where he picked up Luke, as Pastor Kirk showed us a couple weeks ago. Um, Luke is the person that actually wrote the book of Acts. And so uh, chapter 15, let's see, so it starts in Jerusalem right here. I love, I, I geek out about this, especially the math guy in me. I love it when they give me like scales, which this, this map doesn't have a scale. And then I can start thinking the math guy, get some ratios and figure out how far he, anyways, all right. So he starts in Jerusalem, goes on up to Antioch. That's chapter um, 15. In chapter 15, he goes from Jerusalem to Antioch on into Tarsus, Okay. And then chapter 16, he, he just starts moving. He goes through Derby, uh, Lystra, Iconium, a, another uh, town called Antioch. And then he long treks it all the way over here to Troas. And then he kind of gets on a boat. And at the end of chapter 16, he's in Philippi, which is where he starts the church um, for, that he wrote the book of Philippians to, the letter of, uh, to the church in Philippi. Last week, Pastor Buddy started chapter 17 with us, and in chapter 17, he leaves Philippi, and he comes into Amphipolis, which is just really fun to say, Uh, and and then he goes through Apollonia, and then on into Thessalonica, and in Thessalonica, things go great for Paul. I mean, it's like vacation. They actually bring him dinner. It's just awesome. I'm totally lying. (laughs) It goes horrible. Uh, he gets kicked out of town. You guys remember that? Pastor Buddy talked last week. If you, if you don't remember, check out his message last week. It was a great message. But he, uh, he gets kicked out of Thessalonica. And the Thessalonians, they, they do not like him at all. And they're actually going to pop back up tonight. And so tonight, he has fleed from Thessalonica. And we're going to pick it up in Berea. And then he leaves Berea and comes all the way down into Athens. And that's the rest of chapter 17. And then next week, Pastor Kirk's going to pick it up and take us all the way through chapter 18, which is the rest of his journey back to Jerusalem. So this is 24 verses in, uh, that we're going to cover tonight, but it's a really intriguing story. Because in 24 verses, you see Paul's experience in Berea. And then you see his experience in Athens. You're going to see both of them. And so what I'd like to do is read through both of those and then kind of talk through it. So if you could hang with me for 24 verses, just kind of lock in. If you got your iPhone, if you're online, you got your Bibles or you got your Bibles in here, just hang with me. And we're going to go through this entire missionary um, portion of his journey. Man, I, I have a lot of respect for missionaries. Like... That would literally, so if this was home, and guys, there, there wasn't no, like, there, there was no, like, <laughs> you understand that that's like sandals. You guys understand this, right? 
all right? And, and he's all the way, like, I got mad respect for missionaries. In fact, when Ruth and I started dating in college, I hope it's okay to say this, she was minoring in missions, and we started dating. She, her, heart, so she was, um, her heart was to go on the mission field, and she was getting her, was, was your, um, your bachelor's was still in education, right? What was it? Well, oh, your, your, so she was actually getting a degree in missions. Oh, wow, I thought it was a minor. <laughs> wow, <laughs> she loves me, guys. So she was majoring in missions. Her heart was to go on the mission field. She was going to get a minor that would equip her so she could get into some countries with that minor. And um, is that right? Am I remembering that right? You were double majoring. <laughs> I, should have, I should have checked my facts before I got on stage. <laughs> anyway, so her and I are on a date, and she starts just telling me about all this. I want to go on the missions field. I'm excited about it. And I'm picturing, like, like dirt homes. And, and I just looked at her, and I'm like, I need a microwave, like, just so you know. Like, I don't feel compelled <laughs> in any sense of the word. And my woman loves me, y'all. She changed her major and uh, has now, honestly, I feel like, though, that God has sent us into the mission field in Maine um, you guys do realize this, that even though you might not go overseas on a missions field, you are a missionary for Jesus. Do you realize that? Like, the scriptures actually calls you an ambassador for Christ. Like, you are representing Christ at your work, in your home. You are a missionary for Christ. But for the missionaries that actually do it, like leave the house, and, and I, got, I got mad respect. I love talking to Pastor Brian. I see him back there. Spent years in Africa I love hearing his story from the mission field. Anyways, I am rambling. All right, so let's jump into this. Let's start. We're in Acts chapter 17, starting in verse 10. So that very night, the believers sent Paul and Silas to Berea. When they arrived there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. And the people of Berea were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica. And they listened eagerly to Paul's message. So is it going good in Berea? Yeah, they listened intently, right? Uh, they searched the scriptures day after day to see if Paul and Silas were actually teaching the truth. So they're pulling out their own Bibles and being like, is this real? Is this legit? As a result, as a result of what? As a result of they heard something from Paul that they hadn't heard, and then they checked it out for themselves. You see that? As a result of that, many Jews believed, as did uh, many of the prominent Greek women and men. But when some of the Jews in Thessalonica, <laughs> they did not like him. It's, it's, it's humorous to me. <laughs> uh, when some of the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God in Berea, they went there and stirred up more trouble. Have you ever moved on just to find that it seems like it follows you there. Have you ever done that? Like maybe you change jobs, you get to the new job, and then it's like, oh, the same giants are here. Or, you know what I'm saying? And the Thessalonians have showed up again. And that's what happened with Paul. And so here's what Paul did. Uh, he sat down and said, oh, God must not want me to do this. And he gave up. That's not true. The believers acted at once, and they sent Paul from Berea, because there was Thessalonians there causing trouble, so they sent Paul away. They sent him on down the coast, while Silas and Timothy remained behind to disciple the people that got saved in Berea. Those who escorted Paul went with him all the way. And if you remember that map, that was all the way. They, they went from Berea all the way down the coastline to Athens. Okay, go to the next slide. That is the next slide. I got you. You're with me better than I am. And then they returned, so they, they brought him down to Athens. They returned back to Berea with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him there. While Paul was waiting in Athens, he sat on his hands and said, well, I guess there's nobody with me, so I've got nothing to do. That's not true. <laughs> like, he is compelled, right? While he was in Athens, he was deeply troubled by all of the idols that he saw everywhere in the city. I remember all of my years... Working in the secular workforce, if you don't know this, I spent 13 years uh, teaching mathematics at the high school and collegiate level, 
And man, I saw, can you go back a slide? I saw many things that troubled me. And I did just like stir something in you. What troubles you? Like, what is that thing that you see? And you're like, for the, for the name of Jesus, I got to do something about this. Anyways, <laughs> next slide, next slide. Uh, he went to the synagogue to reason with the Jews. So he's troubled about this. So he goes to the synagogue to reason with the Jews and all the God-fearing Gentiles. He spoke daily in the public square to anyone who would listen. All right, go to the next one. He also had a debate with some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. So remember, he's now in, in Greece. Like, he's in Athens. Very, very intellectual society. When he told them about Jesus and his resurrection, they said, what is this guy talking about? What is, what's he trying to say with these strange ideas that he seems to have picked up? Others said he seems to be preaching about some type of foreign god. Then they took him to the high council of the city. Come and tell us about this new teaching, they said. You're saying some rather strange things, and we want to know what it's all about. Parentheses. You need to listen to this. It should be explained that all of the Athenians, as well as the foreigners, anybody in Athens, loved to spend all of their time talking about the latest idea, the trending topics. So are they interested in Jesus? No, not even a little. They're interested in, this is a new idea. All right, go to the next, oh, you are, girl, <laughs> what? All right, so Paul, standing before the council, addressed them as follows. And I love Paul's approach to these people that he knows are intellectual. It's obvious that they have things that they idolize. So he goes to them, and he doesn't... He, look at how ingenious his approach is. He says, men of Athens, I notice that you are very religious in every way. For as I was walking along, I saw your many shrines and your idols... And one of your altars had this inscription on it, to an unknown God. So they're like, we think we got them all, but just in case, we're going to put a random one over here to some God we haven't heard about yet. Paul says, this God, the unknown God, this God whom you worship without even knowing who he is, is the God that I am telling you about. That's ingenious. He's saying, you've known your creator all along. You just didn't know it. It's written in your hearts, right? He is the one God who made the world and everything in it. So basically, he's saying this unknown God is above every other idol that you have in this town, right? He is the one God who made the world and everything in it. Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples. Come on, somebody. And, he, and human hands can't serve his needs, for he, he has no needs. He himself gives life and breath to everything, and he satisfies every need. From one man, he created all of the nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and when they should fall. He determined their boundaries. His purpose was for the nations to seek after him and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. That's ingenious. He's saying you already know him. It's written in your hearts. You just haven't met him yet. He says, though he is not far away from any of us, for in him, come on, anybody from the 80s and 90s? In him we live <laughs> and move. Anybody? And nobody else in heaven. Yeah, what? Oh, that, all right, anyways. <laughs> I thought I was going to be alone. I don't know who that was over here, but I love you. All right. For in him we live and move and exist as some of your own poets. So again, he's saying you've already known him. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. And since this is true, we shouldn't think of God as an idol designed by craftsmen, uh, craftsmen from gold or silver or stone. God overlooked people's ignorance about these things in earlier times. But now, now he commands everyone everywhere to repent. That is not a popular word. That is, I was wrong. It's not someone else's fault, it's mine. And I was wrong. To repent of their sins and turn to him. 
For he has set a day for judging the world. Now listen to me. I am not going to preach on this, but I am going to say this. There is a righteous God. And he can judge you. (laughs) He can look at you and say, that is wrong. He has set a day for judging the world with justice. I'm not going to comment on that word, but that is a trending word right now. He has set a day for judging the world with, I'm going to add a word here, with his justice. By the man he has appointed. And he proved to everyone who this person was by raising him from the dead. Who's he talking about? Jesus. When they heard Paul speak about the resurrection, now remember, they're just like, this is a new idea. Let's be intellectual here, right? He says, when they heard Paul speak about the resurrection of the dead, they all fell on their knees and worshiped. No. <laughs> it says some of them laughed at him with contempt. Some of them said, why don't you tell us some more? It's interesting. That ended Paul's discussion with them. Some of them actually did join him and become believers. Among them were Dionysius, a member of the council, and a woman named Damaris, and then others with them. So you have two cities, Berea and Athens. And Paul proclaims the same gospel truth to both cities. You with me? And you have two separate responses to the gospel. And I want to contrast those real quick. So if you'll humor me, I'm going to jump back. Let's look at Berea real quick, and let's see the Berean response when they hear the truth of Scripture. They search the Scriptures day after day. So Paul told them the gospel, and they went and checked it out for themselves. So they searched the Scriptures day after day, and as a result, many believed. Okay, that's the Berean response. They, 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 they checked it out for themselves, and then they believed. Many believed. That's a key word, many, right? Okay, let's look at the Athenian response. They took him to the high council of the city. They said, come tell us this new teaching. Go to the next slide. You're saying some rather strange things, but really all they cared about was, this is some new ideas. This is new knowledge. Go to the next slide. And as a result of their approach, their response, some of them laughed, some of them joined, some of them became believers. So you have two responses. You have the Berean response. Go to the next slide. You have the Berean response where they measured Paul's words against what they knew was true, which was Scripture. And as a result of the Berean response, many of them came to faith in Christ. I promise you this. If you're online or if you're in the room and you're not sure about this Jesus, get yourself a Bible and check it out. And I promise you that if you check it out for yourself, I know where you'll end up. I know. Many believed. All right, the Athenian response, they listened to the latest teaching, but they did it because they wanted to expand their human reasoning. Like they wanted to, they're gaining knowledge, right? And as a result of this, Some of them laughed and mocked. Some of them said, let's talk about it some more. And some of them joined and became believers. So both groups of people received new information. And both groups of people evaluated and they, they, they processed it and determined, is this true or not? They did it differently, but that's really what they're doing. Is this real? Is this true? And I want to ask you a question. How do you measure truth? Like, how do you hear something and say, that's true? Right? Like, you get home, you flip on the news, or maybe you grab your iPhone and open the, the news app, and you read something. How do you determine if that is true? That's an important question to ask. Maybe you're on Instagram, you're just scrolling through it, and you come across somebody 
that did a video, and it's their latest thesis on life, right? How do you determine if what they're saying is true or is crazy? <laughs> That's an important question to ask. Because literally, the amount of information that is coming at us today you need to be able to evaluate, is this, is this true? Is it true? And there's really only two options that you have here to make that evaluation, and you saw them here. You can evaluate it with reasoning, or you can evaluate it with Scripture. Those are your options. How about this one? You're in church, and you hear something and you think, is that right? How do you measure that? Because the Bereans were in church, the Athenians were in church, and you might say, Jay, Jay, it's church, it's going to be true. <laughs> last, last time I checked, the only person that had perfect revelation of God was Jesus. Amen. Right? So you're in church and you hear something. Or how about this? You're at a Christian conference. Oh, it's a conference. I paid for it. It's going to be true. <laughs> or how about this? You flip on the radio, or you grab your iPhone, open Apple Music, and you're like, oh, new songs. It's in the Christian section, so it's good. And you hit play, and something in you says, that ain't good. How do you measure truth? And I'm just going to be real with y'all. There are some new teachings. There are some, what did it say in, in, in Acts? Did it say new teachings, right? There are some new teachings that are trying to, even in church, sneak in. And you need to be able to say, that is not correct, right? And what's crazy is this is not a new problem. I could pull a lot more examples and show them to you. I've got three. I'm going to go through them pretty quick here, so just hang with me. The first one is in 2 Corinthians. So Paul's writing to a church in Corinth. He says, look, you happily put up with whatever anyone tells you. Oh, it's the pastor. <laughs> it's the guest speaker at the conference. You happily put up with whatever anyone tells you, even if they're preaching a different Jesus. Or maybe they're preaching a different spirit or a different gospel. Listen, I, was in a con I, I wasn't in the conference. Ruth showed me a video from a Christian conference. And I heard the guy say, these are his words. This is the heartbeat of the gospel. He was not talking about Jesus. I'm like, What? The last time I checked, the good news was the death and resurrection of my Savior so that men's sins could be washed away and we could walk in newness of life. I am not adding to the work of my Savior. Amen. All right, I got another one for you. Galatians, Paul's writing to the church in Galatia. So this is a whole different church. Same problem, some, some new teaching. I am shocked that you are turning away so soon from God who called you to himself through his loving mercy of Christ. You are following a different way that is pretending to be the good news. But it is not the good news at all. You are being fooled. How do you measure truth? I got one more for you. This is from, uh, from 1 John. He says in 1 John chapter 4, Dear friends, do not believe everyone that says, The Lord told me. Last time I checked, Satan used scripture against Jesus. <laughs> Don't believe everyone who claims they speak by the Spirit. You must test them. So I'm going to ask you again. How do you measure truth? Because you need to. You need to. What do we, what do we pray tonight? God, put a guard over the things that come into my mind. You need to measure truth. And I don't know about y'all, online or in the room, but I want to be like the Bereans. Amen. I want to measure truth. I want to measure, I'm not going to call it truth. I want to measure, measure the true 
with the truth. Chuck Ives is a dear friend of mine and a mentor. He goes to church here. Uh, he teaches me a lot on scriptures, insanely smart. Um, God has given him a lot of insight into scripture. And he actually told me this, talking about the passages from 1 John that I just showed you. He said, Jay, there is a difference between something being true and something being truth. Truth is the tool that you use to measure what is true. Amen. Not my own reasoning. Because even that, that speaker at the conference that Ruth showed me, I heard him and I'm like, man, that sounds right. Like that sounds, what does Pastor Kirk say? Like it just has to be 1% off. There can be 99% good and 1% off. You know the example he does where he says you make a brownie and you put just a little bit of rat poison in it? Right? It's okay. It's, it's a teaspoon of rat poison. It's okay. It is dangerous. It is dangerous. Proverbs 14 Look at this, Proverbs 14, before every man, there lies a wide and pleasant road. Oh, that sounds right. Yes, of course, that must be, that must be. That's what everybody's agreeing to. Everybody is saying that that is it. Even in church, I hear him saying it. But it ends in death. And so hear my heart. It is costly to believe the wrong thing. It ends in death. And so I will ask you again, how do you measure your truth? Amen. As I was studying and preparing for this message, I read this, this saying, uh, this, this quote, and I want to read it to you because I was like, I cannot say it better than this. So it came from the Life Application Bible, and it is a footnote at the bottom of the Bible. It says, in a free society... People have the right to religious opinions. Yeah, but that don't mean them right. they're right. <laughs> so that does not guarantee that their ideas are right. God does not accept man-made religions as a substitute for faith in Jesus. Amen. And the danger is that it can sound right. What did that proverb say? It's a wide and pleasant road. And it can make, make sense to my human reasoning. But, mm -mm. I want to measure truth by the word of God. Amen. Proverbs chapter 12 says, wickedness never brings stability. You want to know why it never brings stability? Because you are literally tossed to the next trend. This is what culture says was right, right? No, 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 we're more enlightened. This is what's right. I'm sorry, but listen, if it was wrong now, then it was wrong then. And if it was wrong then, then it's still wrong now. And I don't care how you dress up sin, it's still sin. But wickedness won't bring stability because you will literally be tossed by the trending topics. And it's like a ship just thrown back and forth. But the godly have deep roots. So do you want to know how to measure truth? Have deep roots. When all of culture is saying, we thought it was this, but no, we realize it's actually this. You want to know how to measure if that's right? Have deep roots. Whenever the church, it seems, is questioning things that I'm pretty sure shouldn't be questioned, you want to know how to know if it's right? Have deep roots. Have deep roots. In Luke chapter 8, Jesus, this is where we're going to sit for the, the last couple minutes here. In Luke chapter 8, Jesus tells you how to have deep roots. It's a great parable. Um, it's the scattering of the seed. And he talks about how to have deep roots. He says, the seed that fell on good soil represents honest, good-hearted people who hear God's word, they cling to it, and they patiently produce a harvest. 
Three things. How do I measure truth? I have deep roots in Scripture. I have deep roots. The first thing, how, how, do, you, how do you develop deep roots in Scripture? Because maybe you're sitting there and you're thinking, okay, Jay, yeah, that's right. That's right. But how do you actually have those deep roots? The first one, you hear it. What did he say? They hear it. Like daily. Put it before you. Not on Sunday morning. Not in the morning when you're checking your notifications and, nope, yep, there's the verse of the day. No, for, uh, Colossians 3.16. Look at this, Colossians 3.16. Let the word dwell in you. Do you know what the word dwell means? That's where it lives. Amen. It's in you. Listen to me, church. If you don't have a daily reading plan, start there. Have a daily reading plan where you say, you know what, Netflix can be taken off of my day, but this will not. Like the Red Sox, who, by the way, beat the Tigers, if anybody cares. Um, the Red Sox can be taken off of my day, but this... This dwells, this lives with me. So if I miss it in the morning, I'm going to catch it at lunch. And if lunch is crazy, I'm going to catch it before I go to bed. Dwell. Charles Spurgeon, I love this quote. Charles Spurgeon says, A Bible that is falling apart usually belongs to someone whose life isn't. A Bible that is falling apart usually belongs to someone whose life isn't. And listen to me. What did, that, what did Jesus say? He said, you hear it. You hear it. So don't, go to that next slide, don't just read the Bible, listen. Listen. If the Bible is the Word of God, then maybe, just maybe, God's trying to tell you something through it. So don't just check the box. Listen. Lord, is there something that you want to tell me this morning? I'm not just checking boxes and, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen to what you want to know. I'm going to listen to your truth. What do you say about justice? What do you say about this or that topic? Or th I'm going to listen to you. And, and, and let it go past your head and into your heart. Remember, the Athenians were reasoning. I love Psalm 119. Psalm 119, verse 11. I have hidden your word in my heart. Makes me think the things that I hide are the things that I treasure. You know what I'm saying? You got the safe. I don't, I don't put things in my safe and stick it in the front yard and put a sign that says valuables here, right? I treasure it. Lord, I'm going to take your word and I'm going to hide it in my heart. And I'm going to listen to see if you're trying to tell me something. I love Luke 8.18. Listen to what Jesus says. Those who read my teachings, those who are listening, so maybe you read the word and you're like, Jay, this don't make sense. Which, by the way, there are still things in Scripture that I'm like, what? <laughs> right? Maybe you read the word and it don't make sense. But you know what the Bible says? If you will continue and you will let it dwell in you and you will listen, you will be given more understanding. Because God says, I can trust you with my secrets. All right, hear it. Second one. Second thing he said, they hear it and they cling to it. They cling to it. Like, regardless of the consequences, this is my foundation. And the last time I checked, you don't move a building off its foundation. So this is where I'll die. They cling to it. I might lose my job. I might not get that raise. I might no longer be accepted in that, that crew of friends at the lunch table. Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is an amazing chapter for the, just the love of the Word of God. It says, Ev evil people try to drag me into sin, but I am anchored to your Word. I'm not leaving it. So listen, don't just, don't just read it. Don't just listen to it. Accept its authority. Like when, when science doesn't match up with what I'm reading in Scripture, 
I'm taking scripture. When, when what, what people are saying in the headlines doesn't match what I, I read in scripture, right? How about this one? When the sin in my life doesn't match what I read in scripture, I will accept the authority of scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 3. All scripture is breathed by God. And so when everyone else says, Jay, you don't understand, we need to reinterpret it. Last time I checked, Isaiah 40 says that the word of God is timeless. That, that everything else will fade away, but this will stand. That's all I need. That's all I need. I am a living testimony of the fact that the word of God will stand. So I will listen to his word, and I will cling to his word. Romans chapter 3, I love this. Let God be true, and everything else is false. I will accept your authority on things, Jesus. Listen, be a student of the word. Study scripture. Like, study it. There are so many resources. I was talking with Pastor Kirk. I was talking with the guys at Rock School of Ministry last night. And there are so many resources out there that are free. Like, become a student of the, of the Bible. If you read something that doesn't make sense, then get some tools. Have a mentor, like I have with, with, with Chuck Ives. The whole reason that Chuck Ives is a mentor to me is because I was reading things in Scripture that did not make sense to me. And I said, will you help me? Enroll in Rock School of Ministry. We're still accepting applications. I think we still have room for students, don't we? We still have room for students. Enroll in Rock School of Ministry. Like, like become a student of the Word. Cling to the Word. I remember, I'm going long. Holy cow. Sorry. We're getting there, guys. I love talking about the Bible. All right, here we go. Um, when I, was a, when I was a student, I went to a Christian liberal arts university. Christian liberal arts. Heavy on the liberal, light on the Christian. And so I, I have a minor, actually. I have a minor in theology. And I literally, w I, I sat in classes. Listen, I knew, I had professors that had read the Bible, but they had never listened. And I literally sat in classes where professors would argue the dumbest things. I'm talking like, was Jesus a guy or a girl? Like, like just things that you're like, what? And you know what I did? I sat back and said, oh, well, the guy that has a PhD said it, so this must be what it is. No. I went and I grabbed my Bible. And I grabbed my mom's, actually. My mom's. I have her old study Bible. I grabbed my mom's study Bible. I went, and I, I went to town, baby. I became a Berean. And I measured everything that those teachers said against what I was reading. And if it didn't line up, they're wrong. I don't care how many PhDs they have. All right, the third one. You hear it. You listen to what he's telling you. You cling to it, regardless of your circumstances. And the last one is you let it patiently produce a harvest in you. We're not too good with patient. I love that in Galatians chapter 5, God says that the Holy Spirit will produce fruit in you. And I love that he calls it fruit. Because if I want an apple, and I take an apple seed and I plant it today, am I going to have apples in the fall? No, it's going to take years. And not only is it going to take years, it's going to take years of cultivating, right? You got to take care of that thing. I was talking with Pastor Brian about some apple trees he planted. Like, you have got to care for that tree. You got to baby the thing, feed it, protect it. And the Word of God will change you. If you, if you hear it and you cling to it and you accept its authority, but listen to me, guys. Be patient. <laughs> maybe you've been following God for six months. Maybe you've been following six years, maybe 20 years. Be patient. 
Because the change does not start with what you see. It starts at your roots. Romans chapter 12 says, don't become so well-adjusted. Look at this. Don't, don't just take whatever culture's throwing at you. This is the trending topic. Everybody says it's okay, so... Don't become so well-adjusted to culture that you fit in and you don't even think about it anymore. You're not measuring, is this true? Instead, fix your attention on God. You will be changed from the inside out. So maybe you're sitting here and you're thinking, Jay, that's, that's easy for you to say. I mean, you've been following God for 22 years. Not that old, John. It's easy for you to say. You know, I remember, I remember when Isaac was born. He's 27. I've been following God for almost 10 years. And I remember looking at my little boy, and I remember thinking, I want to lead him in truth. And so at the age of 27, I grabbed the Bible, and I had never read the whole Bible. In all, in all honesty, I had read Proverbs, Psalms, and the Gospels, and then verses here and there in the New Testament. And I grabbed my Bible that my mama gave me whenever I came back to church at the age of 18. I grabbed my Bible. And I said, I'm going to get myself on a plan so that I know what I need to read. I'm not going to just drop it open and point. I'm going to read, and I want to read this entire Bible at the age of 27. And I can tell you that except for two years, I will be 41 this summer. I have read the Bible every single year since the age of 27. And I can tell you that there are things that in 13 years of reading the Bible, consistently hearing it, clinging to it, patiently letting it change me. There are things that it, it has worked out of me, but I can also tell you this, there's still things left. So let it patiently produce fruit in your life. There's an old, old saying that says, the best time, go to the next slide, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. And so I would ask you, how do you measure truth? Is it with your understanding? Or is it with scripture? Psalm 119 says that his word will light your path. It will show you that is not true. That is not for me, even though they said it was. It will, it will show you, it will change you, it will work in your heart, but you have to let it. So when's the best time to start? Now. Now. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you gave us your word. That your word is a light to show us which way to go. And so Lord, I pray right now, whether you're you're in the room or you're online, I pray right now that your word would become like Jesus said, where it is, it is our daily bread. We get life through your word. Lord, let your word be so hidden in our hearts that we would be able to evaluate what is true and what is a lie. We would be able to evaluate what is, what is false, what is, even if it's fact, if it does not line up with your word, it is not true. Lord, we say we need you. Give us revelation into your word. Lord, I thank you. You tell us in your word that you are a God of love. Why don't you guys stand up with me? You know, if you have never given your life to God and accepted his love, I want to give you a chance to do so right now. And it's a simple heart decision. It's not the head, it's not the reasoning, it's the heart. And it's a heart that says, God, I choose you. Please forgive my sin. 
I give you my life. And if you're making that decision tonight, I would ask that you tell us. Let us know. Grab me or one of the staff here. We'd love to give you a Bible, answer any questions you might have online. They're giving you a link that you can fill the connect card out and let us know. We'll mail you a Bible or anything that you need in this life of following Christ and building a life on his word.